What's up, guys, and welcome to One Take. Tonight, we are talking about Westworld Season 3, Episode 3, titled The Absence of Field. This video is going to be full of spoilers through Season 3, Episode 3, but no spoilers from future episodes, and that includes what is shown on the next time on Preview. I'm Gil. I'm talking to my tech guy slash brother, Alun. Yo. And my good friend, Jeremy. Say hello. Hello. With that, let's jump into tonight's episode. We'll do a quick rundown of Charlotte's story, and then we'll jump over to Cal and Dolores. But before we do that, Jeremy, just wanted to get your take. So far, how are you feeling about season three of Westworld? And just high level, what would you think of tonight's episode? Uh, I'm enjoying season three a lot, probably more than I enjoyed season two, I think. Um, seems to be moving at a much quicker pace. We're getting a lot more information, although that might have been true a little bit more last week than it was this week. But on the whole, still still enjoying it. Love the constant feeling of not knowing when things are, or who anyone is or where we're taking place. It's like right teeters on the edge of that being uh annoying and terrible writing but it's actually really really good and i'm i'm really all the way in i'm I'm enjoying it yeah same here i have been i know you were less down on season two than i was i wasn't a big fan of season two and literally every complaint i had about last season has been reversed corrected and full 360 or i guess you'd want a 180 so you end up facing the other direction uh, so I have been loving <laughs> season three. I think the storyline has been streamlined, but there's still enough complexity there that there's plenty to debate, as we'll see in tonight's video. And I'm way more emotionally invested this season in virtually every character. So I'm absolutely loving this season, and tonight was no exception. So let's start with uh, Charlotte Hale, Tessa Thompson's character. The episode starts off with a quick flashback to the middle of the Westworld massacre. And we see Charlotte beginning to leave a message. At first, we don't know who it's for. From there, we jump to another flashback where we see Dolores creating the Charlotte host. Charlotte wakes up, has an emotional moment where she wonders, where am I? Who am I? Dolores explains that this mystery host is going to have to pretend to be Charlotte Hale so we can control Delos. And Charlotte asks, why did you bring back Bernard? Dolores says, we all have our role to play. So a couple of questions here. Number one, do you have any idea why Dolores brought Bernard back? I feel like we've gotten a couple of potential explanations. Dolores a couple of times has given sort of cryptic reasoning like we saw here. What's your take on that if you have one? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting and, and we are getting those little, little breadcrumbs kind of like you mentioned, it, it seems like it's some kind of a, uh, and you might've even said this yourself last week. I've, somebody said it that like a, like an agent Smith, Neo kind of situation where she thinks that they need both of them in order to get what she ultimately wants. Like maybe if she just comes in as the rogue uh, you know, host society has a way to shut her down. But if there's kind of two, they can create this weird uh, dynamic and maybe work it out from there. That would probably be my my best theory that I'm certainly ready to be swerved on. <laughs> the, uh, the one other theory I would throw into the mix is I wonder if Dolores still feels any loyalty to Bernard or Arnold and her you know, quote unquote creators. And maybe she... Maybe she believes that at some point down the road, he will see her way of thinking and will ultimately become an ally. I'm not sure if I agree with Bernard's take last episode where he says that she's worried she's going to go too far. That just doesn't seem like an aspect of her character we've at all seen so far. But I also think the Dolores we're seeing this season feels very different than the one we saw last season so i'm not sure we fully understand her character yet uh, but they've been basically asking this question every episode this season so i'm assuming more light will be shed on her it seems like she has a very specific part of the plan in mind for bernard we all have our role to play so i think it'll be re i think it'll be revealed at some point so charlotte is informed 
that somebody is attempting a hostile takeover of Delos. Over the course of years, they've been buying little bits of Delos, and now they basically own it, which is going to prevent their plans moving forward to become a private company. They figure out that this man is Serac, the person that Dolores learned about last episode, or actually learned about in the first episode. Uh, one thing I love is... They describe Serac as the man is a black hole, which felt like a take on that line we've heard a million times. The guy's a ghost. It just seemed like they were looking for a more creative way to say it. And I also love the way they identified him. The guy, nobody knows anything about him. And apparently black hole is an apt metaphor because the only thing you can learn about him is that if you look at our whole financial system, there's like a $3 trillion gap that can't be explained. That's Serac. He's anonymous, but the richest man in the world. Charlotte learns this information, then goes home and sees the real Charlotte's husband, Jake. When they start kissing and uh, getting physical, <laughs> she starts to make noise and he says, be quiet, he'll hear you. And she asks, who? Jake's not happy about that. And this is where we learn and my understanding here is that this is also where host Charlotte learned that she has a son. And what was your reaction to, to that piece of information? Yeah, awkward scene. I, I mean, at first I didn't know if she knew who the husband was either. Um, but I, I don't know. And, I, and then I started thinking about like when she became Charlotte or whoever's in there became Charlotte, like, do they have all her memories and stuff too? Like, would she know all that stuff? She clearly acted like to me, that reaction said, I, I didn't even know that I had a son well, and she was trying to quickly act fast. And in, in fact, it looked like the whole reason she started coming on to him was to get him to shut up and not figure out that she's not who she really is. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking that a little bit, but that was kind of my, uh, that was my read on it there. No, I think you're right, because up to this point, I hadn't really thought at all about the complexities of taking over Charlotte's life. I think I took for granted that they have... I Actually, I don't think I even pondered the question at all whether or not she had Charlotte's memories. But when you think about it, how could she have Charlotte's memories? I, I don't think we've seen anything to indicate that you can take a biological human being and just extract all of their memories. So I think that Dolores at a minimum didn't know Charlotte had a son and I agree Charlotte did seem caught off guard that her husband was there she first thing she asked is how the f did you get in here and he says you know I lived here for eight years and that's like you said where she basically shuts him up with her mouth right so the only weird thing then with that is if you can't get back details on someone does that mean that all the stuff with um Dolores and uh Cal Caleb is on like a different timeline then maybe because that's constantly a thought I find myself thinking too. I'm so used to Westworld whenever you're jumping around, not just being a shift in location, but also usually a weird shift in like 30 years for, for no right. reason. And, and I don't know because like Dolores obviously was able to get all that info using whatever computer, if it's the Reba bomb or whatever <laughs> thing, like to get all that stuff on, on Caleb's whole backstory, you know, they should have been able to do that with Charlotte too, or maybe Charlotte doesn't have access to that. I, I don't know. I'm not really sure. No, fair point. I do think that Dolores got that information on Caleb from Rehoboam. I think that's how you pronounce that database. Um, but it didn't seem to me like she has free access to that database. I think that was maybe one small piece of the information she retrieved. So I could see a situation where, at a minute, you know, at a minimum, well, actually, when Dolores created Charlotte, that was before she came back to the mainland. And I think before she knew about Insight and Rehoboam. So when she gets to Caleb, that's after she learned about this database and maybe was able to get some of that information, potentially from the guy that she killed in the cold open of episode one. That's true. That's a good point. Uh, but. Other thoughts in this scene, when she does go up to see her son, and her son can basically recognize that this is not his real mother, just makes me appreciate the depth that they've added to every character this season. When we went into season three, 
First off, I assumed that Charlotte was basically just a clone of Dolores. It didn't occur to me that Dolores had to take another mind and stick it in this new Charlotte body. So I didn't think there was going to be any complexity there whatsoever. It was just going to be a sort of, hey, we've got somebody in control of uh, Dolus now. But they've added this whole thing where Charlotte now needs to contend with taking over the previous Charlotte's personal life, with com which comes with the tragedy of having to take over this mother's life. And am I going to be a mother to this kid who wants his mom back? And she struggles with this identity crisis. Just a heartbreaking moment. And very, just like I said, my one of my biggest complaints of season two was the fact that most of the main characters were hosts and I didn't find any of them sympathetic. I kind of hated them. And now I'm intrigued by all of them and I sympathize with all of them. But enough of the emotional lovey-dovey stuff. Let's get to Westworld theorizing who is the host that's in the Charlotte body? Jeremy, any theories? Yeah, so two things. One is that where we leave off at the end of the previous season, obviously, is is uh, Dolores is inside the, the, the Charlotte body, which I, you know, when that ended, I, I feel like we're all taking that for granted now that it was easy that they just swapped back because this season has basically matter of factly started with like, oh, well, obviously it's Dolores inside Dolores, even though that's not the way things were when we left them, you just assume it, but whatever, I'll, 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 that'll, we'll just take that as a, as a given fact, because that's the way the show is addressing it, even though I think it's probably not true because they haven't addressed it at all. Uh, I think the Charlotte, I think the biggest clue we get, and it's obvious, but from this episode is the scene with the, you know, the, uh, guy in the in the park uh, touching her son's hand which i don't know if we want to wait till we get to there for it but i think that was kind of our our biggest clue or my biggest like oh this is got to be you know i mean to me maybe like william i don't know if that's going too much out on a on a limb but some kind of a some kind of a william version based on that moment of choking that guy and the all the conversations about nobody knows you better than I do and, and all the things like that. I just don't know where else all that history would have come in from. I mean, Teddy seems like the other thing, but I think they want you to think Teddy, which means it's probably not him. Oh, but you I don't know. think Maybe William the human, basically a host clone of his mind inserted into the Charlotte body. S something to that end somehow. Yes, yeah. oh, just because of the way that they say the word predator and because, and I'm probably overthinking a lot of this, but like we have that weird flash forward scene at the end of last season. We also know that he has all the, like he's obviously has been in that park enough to have been cloned and fidelity tested and whatever. Mm -hmm. And when he starts having that breakdown of like, who am I really? He cuts himself on the wrist in a very similar way to the way that. Oh, uh, yeah that she does in, in this episode a couple well, times. Well, and in the know. way and that I also William was trying does, to think like... Well, when right, William exactly. was kind of breaking down mentally at the end of season two, he starts cutting his arm open to prove whether or not he's a host. Exactly. And then another thing I was watching, so I watched this with my fiance, and then she pointed out also that it would make sense for William to have crazy emotional issues with a child abandoning them because of all the stuff that he you know, did with his killing his daughter last season and all that stuff. So that's where my head is at. I think, I don't know. It, it maybe feels like a, a step too much, but that so is everything else in this show. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> I, I love the theory. The moment you said it at first, you said, William, I was like, who is William? Because my mind only went to who are all the hosts on the show. And then I remembered it's the human and I thought no way. But as you've talked through it, I actually kind of like that theory. And I think it fits because I figured whoever this host is, Dolores seems to have a very personal connection with whoever's brain is in there. So the first place my mind went was Teddy, potentially. And she did have that very protective relationship with him, where although it was romantic in one sense, she was definitely above him in that relationship as somebody that's more awake and informed. She was the lead in it. And we see some of that here with uh, the Charlotte character. But between those two theories, right now I put my money on the William theory, which would be really interesting because as far as 
I know, I think the real William, the human William, is alive at this point because he was alive at the end of season two. You know, putting aside the flash forward in the post credit sequence, but I believe that was flashing very far forward into the future, whereas season three is only a few months after season two. So it'd be very interesting to see real William meet William clone in Charlotte Hale's body, William. But I like your theory. We'll see. So fr- yeah, this is- go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I just, there's just so many weird different things. Like, you know, this could be a, the, um, Dolores has that whole conversation about mirror universes. And there's so many different ways that it could be him, even though right now it seems like it doesn't make sense. Like there's so many different options. So have you heard the theory? Just speaking of crazy theories, you know that there was the Westworld movie back in the seventies. You know what the sequel to that movie was called? Oh, is it uh, future world future right? world? Yeah. Could this entire season take place in the mysterious park future world and none Absolutely. of this is real i think that would be a disappointing way of doing <laughs> it but i think something like that could certainly be at play yeah we'll see i'm not a fan of that theory but i've heard that one thrown around but we'll see so from there charlotte is informed that after the westworld massacre which i don't think they call it that in the show but i've taken to calling it that <laughs> They found that some HCUs, or host control units, went missing, one of which was Maeve, which we knew about. And she's informed there is a mole inside Dolis that's been feeding info to Serac. Charlotte is freaking out. She goes to meet Dolores in a hotel. Dolores sees that Charlotte is cutting herself and uh, in a very specific pattern. She sees sort of a circle and a line over her chest a circle and a line down her arm. And Dolores is able to sort of calm Charlotte down and give her a few orders. You've got to find the mole and kill him or her. You cannot let us lose control to Serac. You've got to convince the board to make a counteroffer. And to do that, you'll have to pay a visit to an old friend. So I won't keep harping on it, but I just love the identity crisis stuff with Charlotte And uh, when she has her emotional breakdown here, one of the most uh, impressive acting things that Westworld does is that these hosts have to go through such a wide range of emotions on command. I think the first time I noticed it back in season one was with Dolores' father, where he over and over, I actually feel bad for the actor that he had to do this, but he constantly had to go from calm, Dolores' father, very paternal, great, to having a mental breakdown, crying. And we see Tessa Thompson do a little bit of that here. Her acting, I think, was very impressive in this episode. And I just very much felt for her in this hotel identity crisis scene and in all of her identity crisis moments. This is also where we very much see Charlotte as kind of, or Dolores, as kind of this motherly figure to Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte says, I don't know what I'd do without you, Dolores. And Dolores tries to uh, reassure her. But anyway, Jeremy, when, when Dolores says you'll have to see an old friend, do you know what she was referring to there? It wasn't clear to me by the end of the episode what that meant exactly. I, I don't necessarily. I mean, I think it could be a million different things, especially if my other th- theory is, is maybe accurate. And because William obviously would have had a lot of real world friends. Um, but I did, that is one thing that has happened a couple times this season that I don't like very much. Like if that were, I know it sounds insane to say if this were real, but if this were real, she wouldn't say that she would just say who it was. It's the same thing as when they're in the plane and someone's like, Oh, well, how, when was the last time you were here? And she says something to the effect of like, I haven't been here in quite some time. Like you wouldn't <laughs> talk like that. You would just say like, you know, but if there's a time jump that would have given away the time jump. So she can't say it that way. There's right. a couple little weird, like conversational quirks. It happens here with that, where you'd never say that. And it happens a lot in the exposition, heavy conversation with Sirach that I'm sure we'll get to at the back end of the episode where he like ham fists, all this stuff in when he's like, well, you told me you would bring me all the info. Don't you remember that? Like, it's, it's really clunky. Um, but I don't, I, I'll, I'll just piggyback off my own theory and say that if it's William inside there somehow that the old friend is, is some contact he had from when he was running things. Right. Right. 
That is, that's a good point. It would be as if my brother asked me, who are you live streaming with tonight? I was like, an old friend. No, no, no. <laughs> who, who is it? You know, right. a friend from a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> if I were to play devil's advocate, here's what I could say, is that with Rehoboam and the absurd invasion of privacy that's happening in this world, you might want to speak in code and not say who that old friend is. You know, try to keep under the radar. But, that's true. How about uh, this theory? Right, what about ahead. if old friend the other time old friend is used uh, perhaps famously in uh, in in cinema would be at the end of silence of the lambs i'm having an old friend for dinner what does that have to do with anything oh, of course it started anthony hopkins uh <laughs> maybe he maybe robert ford is is the old friend i did actually think when charlotte went to the house at the end of the episode and they put those glasses on her which i assume are sort of augmented reality glasses so i say to myself mm. She's about to see someone who's not really there. I thought for a second maybe it was going to be Anthony Hopkins. Uh, but yeah, I was it wrong. It could certainly be. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's go from there. So, yeah, I'm not sure who that old friend is. Um, but we will see in the coming episodes if that's made a little bit clearer. Uh, Charlotte is given a video that was pulled out of the wreckage in the Westworld Massacre. It's the video that the real Charlotte Hale was recording at the beginning of the episode. And if her story wasn't tragic enough, they lay on a little extra slice of awfulness. <laughs> it is the real Charlotte believing that she is potentially about to die, leaving a goodbye video for her son, which ends with her tearfully singing, you are my sunshine, my only son. <laughs> and that's all I can do without getting another YouTube copyright strike. <laughs> and then Charlotte is informed that she is again late to pick up her son from school. So robot Charlotte has not yet learned to <laughs> be a mother. She goes to the school and finds her son with a, a predator, a, a, a pedophile. Um, with, uh, which is just awful to see, especially earlier in the episode, her son is talking about his friend, um, Tom, Tommy or Thomas, Charlotte suggests maybe setting up a play date. And we find out this awful man is that Thomas, she sends her son away and then strangles the guy while giving him some exposition about how you're reminding me who I really am. You're not the only predator around here. And at first, this kind of, I think any other show, this would have bothered me, this exposition-heavy dialogue where she's basically laying out her inner thoughts and telling us what's going through her mind. Basically saying, I've been off my game, but this taste of violence, this taste of punishing someone who deserves it is bringing me back to my old self. That kind of exposition might bother me, but I think season two taught me that these hosts are ones to philosophize out loud like this, and I think they probably got that from, uh, uh, what's the name of the guy from Hannibal we were just talking about? Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins. He, he was very much like this. I think he put a little bit of himself in all of them. What do you think, Jeremy? Do you buy it? Or maybe her host has A History of Violence, co-starring Ed Harris, who is, of course, also <laughs> William. Uh, no, I, I completely buy it. I, I think it's, I, I thought it was a great moment. Like the, the way that she kind of snaps into it, pulls the little sensor thing out of his pocket that we've seen in previous episodes to set up, like, thanks for turning all the cameras off for me. I thought that was awesome. It was a great, it was a great scene. I was like, it was very like exhilarating, uh, scene in a, in a not necessarily as action heavy as other episodes were episode. Um, and I, I was good. It, it, it made me ask all the questions I want to be asking myself when I'm watching a Westworld episode. Yeah, and I'll just add one thing to that to, again, keep going back to season two. But one of my complaints, I didn't find the host sympathetic. They were always murdering humans, regardless of whether they were innocent or not. Or really, the idea was no one's innocent. But here, I feel like every <laughs> time they kill a human, they really go out of their way to make sure you know that human is a scumbag. Episode one, when Dolores kills that guy just casually dropped that he murdered his ex-wife and then for this guy he's a, a child predator so i'm totally on board with him being strangled to death and uh from there so throughout the episode charlotte has been getting phone calls from an unknown number leaving these scrambled voicemails that don't make any sense 
Finally, she calls that number back, then plays each of the scrambled messages in sequence. And we didn't notice this before, but each message was a different tone. When you play them in sequence, you are my sunshine. It is that melody. And that unlocks whatever code you need to put through when you call that unknown number. She gets through to somebody. It's, again, just sort of a scrambled message. She says, I want to meet. The car goes into automatic mode, brings her to a mansion. And who was this unknown caller? It was Sirak. She has a conversation with Hologram Sirak, where we get a pretty big bombshell. Who was the mole this whole time? It was Charlotte herself. But she didn't know because it was Charlotte the human before the Westworld massacre went down. So my understanding of what happened here is that Charlotte went to Ciroc before she went to Westworld, uh, the island, and everything got all messed up. Between her and Ciroc and the database, Rehoboam, they knew that this massacre was going to happen, and it was going to be an opportunity for Charlotte to sneak all of that data that they've been collecting on the island back out to the real world and hand it over to Ciroc. Apparently, it was Charlotte's idea. But, of course, we know everything went wrong. We know that Dolores beamed that data out somewhere, and she has the encryption key. So, Ciroc wants that data. Charlotte doesn't have it. And Ciroc says, you're running out of time. By the way, I know a little bit more than you think, which is that, like I just said, the encryption key that you need to get to this data is in the mind of a host named Dolores. So... (laughs) First off, Jeremy, did I get all that right? And second, this is probably the first time this season where I've, I, I feel levels of confusion similar to those that I felt in season two, but I think I've recalibrated myself. I, I think I was on board with everything you said because I, w- I was also asking all those questions as as the he was spitting out a lot of information at the same time there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's it. Obviously, the big thing was that real Charlotte was the mole. Also, just to jump back really quickly, did you think it was weird where the scene with Charlotte and Dolores in the hotel and she she seems to be touching her on the mole on her face when she was talking <laughs> about being a mole? I thought that was really weird. Um, that's great. It, it was a bizarre, like the Austin Powers type uh, thing. But yeah, no, I, I think I think you summed everything up there. And it just it feels like the amount of information he gave to her in that almost makes it feel like he's trying to manipulate her too like maybe he knows that she's a host like that like there's something else going on there um and this is not necessarily what we're asking about right now too but just while we're talking about extra things going on the constant cutting and dipping to black in between everything in this episode it was so over the top that i just kept thinking it has to be a device for something mm. they a show this smart wouldn't keep doing that without there being a reason i have no idea what the reason is but i'm sure it'll eventually be like really clear or somebody on reddit will figure out that it dipped the black in a morse code that spells out <laughs> like you know drink more ovaltine or, or whatever <laughs> So that's an interesting point. I, anyway. for, I forgot about that, but I do remember during the episode multiple times thinking, all right, the credits are about to roll because they would fade to black for so long before fading back in. That's really interesting. It did it so often. And it was, it made me think like the show doesn't do things like that without having a purpose. Like the same reason last or the same way that last week they lull you into this, like, man, are they really bringing this dude back? Like we saw him get gunned down. Isn't right. the show smarter than this? And then you remember, yes, the show is smarter than this for the, for the most part. So I feel like there's gotta be some other reason that it kept, cause it just, otherwise that would be like just such weird, lazy over the top writing to constantly be dipping to black and dipping yeah. back up. Anyway. Yeah, how disappointing would it be if it was, uh, you know, uh, our running times were running a little uh, short. We needed to fill out 60 minutes. So we just, you know, extended every fade to black by a couple seconds. <laughs> right. Thanks. Thanks, J.J. Abrams. Yeah. Uh, but this is you know, an interesting twist. It kind of makes me want to go back to season two, at least some of it, because uh, well, to see if there's anything in Charlotte's behavior that does indicate she knows more than you think. I do remember that she was. A very, she was very confident in the midst of everything that was going down last season. Part of that is her character does have a reputation for being very tough, so it makes sense. But part of that could also be because she had a pretty good idea what was going on and felt comfortable she would get through it. She didn't count on Dolores. 
Uh, yeah, I like that a lot. I, it, it makes it does make her like it fits everything that she did last season. This does not feel like a new season twist that is weirdly retconning stuff. It, it makes sense with what she did. Yeah, agreed. Satisfying twist. And uh, yeah, any other thoughts on the Charlotte storyline in this episode? Uh, not not for now. Not for me. All right. Well, let's jump over to Cal and Dolores. Just a quick time check, Jeremy. Are you good to keep going here? Uh, I, I am good. All right. Awesome. Speaking of good, let's talk about Cal. <laughs> <laughs> so Cal, last time we saw him, he found a wounded Dolores and ran over to help her. This picks up right there. A few EMTs stop over, throw Dolores into the back of an ambulance. Cal gets in with them, but very quickly after that, they're stopped by cops then Cal sees on his app, which I love this app, the uh, the one that like ba- the Grand Rico. Theft Auto app. What's it called again? Rico. Rico that just gives you petty crimes or even uh, big crimes <laughs> if you want to commit them. And he sees that Dolores is a target. These cops are hired guns that are there to kill her. With Cal's help, Dolores kills the cops, then tells Cal, you're going to have to go on the run and change your name. See ya. So... I don't have a whole lot to say about this scene, except I love the Cal character. I, again, I feel like whatever complaint I had last season, they went so far the other direction because I haven't met a character this sympathetic since Jesse from Breaking Bad. He's sympathetic. He's awesome. It's also so great to once again see him stare down a gun in his face. And then, of course, once he gets through everything, he's more concerned with Dolores than himself. So just such a fan of Cal. And then if you think to yourself, could I be any more of a fan? He goes to visit his sick mother because, of course, like a good son, he looks out for his mother. So he tells her he's going to go away for a while. So he's planning to go on the run, as Dolores recommended. And then again, they want to tug at her heartstrings. She doesn't recognize him, as we saw in the previous episode, which I just need to throw out there. It occurred to me afterwards This is almost a total reversal of what's going on with Charlotte. With Charlotte, you have a son who doesn't recognize his mother or doesn't believe his mother is his mother. Here, you have a mother who doesn't recognize her own son, which also calls into question Jeremy. Charlotte's son doesn't recognize her because she's a host. Cal's mother doesn't recognize him because he's a host. Could it be? Uh, Could certainly be. (laughs) Could certainly be could just be an interesting parallel. Uh, there's there's a lot going on. Another fun parallel thing that I'm thinking with, with all this Cal stuff versus Dolores is Cal is kind of like the Dolores for Dolores. Like what Dolores' Westworld role was, was like, you know, I, I don't know. There's some weird like parallels there too. Um, yeah, parallels that Dolores herself points out later in the episode you're just like me. You're somebody that's being pulled along on a narrative and you don't even know it. People want to control you. So I think that's very apt. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I'll just go down and say, I don't think that Cal is a host, but I do think that the writers suspect that we may think that. And I think they're just, I think it's just them throwing something at us to give some theorizing. I don't think that's going to be the case, but we'll see. So, Cal goes to see his mother, but before he can leave the hospital, a couple guys with guns show up, and they want to get info from Cal on Dolores. They bring him to the edge of a building, and then they open up his mouth, and you see he has a little implant in there, which I think was hinted at in previous episodes, where we keep seeing people put these little chips in their mouth. So I think virtually everybody in the world has these little devices uh, that I'm assuming are sort of like cell phones in your mouth which i'm assuming we'll all have in the future hopefully soon perfect but they they hack into the implant and they increase his heart rate to the point where he's on the brink of a heart attack they hold him on the edge of the building and they want information about dolores but we know cal we know he's not going to give her up in the meantime dolores asks to learn a little bit about cal she sees that he is in a life-threatening situation. And then I believe she hacks into one of the robots, one of the construction robots, which walks over. You think the robot is going to help Cal, and then the guys just throw it over the edge of the building, which was pretty hilarious. But I think that was just a tactic to buy her time so she can show up herself 
and kill those two men, thus saving Cal. Was that robot, was that like Cal's boy robot? I, that was a thing that I didn't know. That was just a random one that Dolores uh, uh, had had like activated to go do that to buy her time. That does make sense to me now that you said it that way. But at first I didn't know if it was his, you know, dude that he rides the elevator with. Right, the one that he was sitting next to having lunch. I think it was one of the promos for the season two. Right, I, yeah, it might have been. Like the... So alternative explanation is that that robot saw it was going down and wanted to help his friend. But he's a construction robot. He's not a, he's not a battle droid. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is it. But, but that's, what a devastating moment for that. Like, what a heartbreaking <laughs> moment for that robot thing which is an interesting too that you, there's a way to break that down too he's a construction robot he can't break his own uh mold if he's on a path that was predetermined for him and, <laughs> and i don't know you see every robot no matter how unimportant seeming has an interesting backstory this season they're all sympathetic even the construction droids that can't even talk absolutely so in one of my favorite moments of the episode which actually made me so glad you're talking to me tonight because it reminded me of one of your favorite lines in cinematic history which is uh from reservoir dogs you know the line i'm talking about uh stop pointing that gun at my dad no <laughs> the one we're in the, where they're in the car and he says cut off his finger the little one let's go get some tacos <laughs> so here after this uh, tragic or near tragic moment where they've been through a lot, Cal says to Dolores, those guys were willing to kill me to get to you. You must be into some pretty bad stuff. And then she says, you must be hungry. Let's get breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so they sit down at a diner and she shows him a transcript of his worst memory. We saw flash flashes of this earlier in the episode where you see Cal uh, as a child, watching his mother walk away, you see ice cream spilling everywhere. So we see a transcript there. where We find out that his mother got up, left him at a table alone. And then I believe her name was Sarah. One of the waitresses walks over and he keeps saying to her, she wouldn't leave me. She's coming back. She wouldn't leave me. This horrible memory. And Dolores shows this to him so he'll understand the awful invasion of privacy and the horrible thing that Insight is doing with the Reho Boehm database. She explains that this is an algorithm that is not just about who you are, but about who they'll let you become. And we find out that we're living in a sort of dystopian future here. They're not just predicting behavior, but they are setting the path for all humans. So we get an even better idea of what's going on here when they walk to the pier together, a pier that is important in Cal's past. She shows him a tablet that gives Cal a social score, says things like marriage not recommended. It lays out that he will always be a construction worker. He'll always be a petty criminal. And not only that, he is going to commit suicide in 10 to 12 years. And she gives him a choice. She says... I can give you money, you can go on the run, or you could start a revolution with me. Why are you telling me all this? Cal asks, and Dolores explains exactly, Jeremy, what you pointed out earlier. You and I are a lot alike. They put me in a cage too. They decided what your life would be, and you want to break out of that. So... And what triggered this for her is that she saw these two men were going to kill Cal. He didn't give her up. So I think Dolores is starting to learn that, hey, we're not all horrible. Not all humans are evil. And Cal says, I'm a dead man either way. At least this way, I get to decide who I want to be. Ironically, he also says to, Dolor to Dolores, you are the first real thing that has happened to me in a long time. So a lot to take in there. Jeremy, just reactions to this revelation uh, did it hit you as hard as it hit me watching Cal hear this prediction about his future? Yeah, that was a tough scene for sure. And again, another awesome job by uh, by Aaron Paul there. Um, I did, I don't know, I'm still kind of iffy on the you're the most real thing to happen to me <laughs> line as being a little like too on the nose, I guess. 
um, unless this is a simulation for Dolores <laughs> and Cal really is the Dolores. The uh, only way it could case... be worse is if you said, you know, I walk around and I feel like everyone's robots. They're the least robot person I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they both have like a, the other parallel that I was thinking of with the Dolores Cal thing is that with the with the parents obviously having their own issues especially since Dolores says that the, the mom, they, they called it schizophrenia or whatever. She says it in a way that implies that it's probably not what really happened. Mm -hmm. Maybe she also had uh, some massive amounts of code stuffed into her brain that overloaded her head. And, you know, similar to Dolores' uh, Mr. Abernathy there on the farm. Um, but yeah, the, the scene emotionally was really good. I'm, uh, I still think that you're too real or whatever, whatever he says line was, was a little much, but I do like the scene. It did make me kind of excited for, you know, whatever the next step is for, uh, for the two of them. Definitely. And I, so much to say about the scene because I, I love how I keep, I keep going back to this, but season two ends, Dolores's plan is to overthrow humanity. I, I'm not really on her side with that, but by the end of this episode, I'm with Dolores if this Rehoboam insight thing is doing what she says, then I want the revolution. And all of a sudden I find myself cheering for Dolores. But the thing I wonder is she seemed pretty hell bent on essentially genocide, destroying the human race here. It seems like she really only wants to go after the evil humans. And I wonder if humanity really does fit into her revolution plan or is she lying to Caleb? And if she's not lying, if truly she's not out to destroy humanity, what changed her view? Or did I misunderstand her view in season two? Uh, I, I think I'm with you. I think she might be lying to him a little bit. I think, I mean, the, the, the obvious parallel, I guess, is what she is doing in the real world is what William did in you know, Westworld where there's some, we were never really sure what he was doing until we got to the end of season one or two, I guess, depending on the way you look at it. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I still think unless there's some weird timeline stuff going on, I do think that her main MO is to just, you know, show humans, at least draw the parallel between they think that they have choice, but really they are no different from her. Right. If right. not destroy everybody. We'll see. Yeah, right now, if I take her at face value, I'm on her side. But there could be something going on here where this is all part of a plan. She's Somehow, Cal is useful to her, and she just sees some role that he'll play. Or she's telling the truth, and uh, we'll see. Either way, I'm worried for Cal. Him getting involved with Dolores is a little nerve-wracking. Uh, I kind of am getting more Jesse vibes. This is similar to him getting mixed up with Walter White and Gus. So <laughs> we'll see. I also love how this paints Cal's character in a little bit of a new light. I think we knew he was dealing with tragedy in his life. We knew he wasn't the happiest person, but I did look at him as a very hardened and confident person. Twice now we've seen him stare down a gun. He also offhand mentioned that he has been shot in the head before. But looking back at it, that could be confidence. It could also be a little bit of apathy. If a decade from now we know he's likely to commit suicide, at this point in his life he might be letting go a little bit of life itself. He might not care as much. And I think it just adds a layer of tragedy to, uh, to his character. And which just leads me into the capper, which is I am loving this show this season. I am rooting for... Every character, or at a minimum, I'm interested in every character, and I sympathize with every character, which is a total opposite of what I was dealing with last season. So, big fan of tonight's episode, have been a big fan of the season so far. A couple of other stray thoughts. Uh, the music has been great this season, and it feels a little bit different every episode, too. In the first episode, it felt kind of synth, sci-fi heavy. It reminded me a little bit of Blade Runner. Here, it sounded a little bit more orchestral, um, different takes on the Westworld theme, and I thought that worked great. Uh, other random thought, last episode, I missed the Cal Dolores storyline. I'm such a fan of the Cal character, but they did such a good job establishing the new Bernard and the new Ashley Stubbs, and I found I missed them this episode. So I'm pretty much invested in every storyline we're seeing here. Which, which is great. Uh, Jeremy, any other thoughts 
on tonight's episode? Um, I am just giving a quick glance. I took some notes during. I think we hit most of the stuff. Oh, you know what? I just a just a stray thought on the how much I hate the Rehoboam being named that because every time someone says it. It reminds me of like I feel like it, it's going to be a twist of of like an Alucard Dracula thing, you know? Like it, it, the name is so clunky that there has to be some weird thing. Like oh well, if you reverse all the letters, and like it spells out like I have been Dolores this whole time, you know, or something like that. Like it's such a like why would you do that? Why would why would it be such a clunky name like that? Right, right. Um, that's that's really the the only <laughs> main thing that we didn't that we didn't actually hit on. I actually did hear. I forget what it was exactly, but I think if you take Arnold or Bernard's uh, fake name that he was going under when he was on the run, there is if you scramble the letters, it does spell something like Bad Arnold, or it's not that, but it was something of that uh, <laughs> similar to that. So like. It's awful. It's an awful. There's no reason it could just be random. I don't want to Google it and then find out that it's like, oh, well, in ancient Greece, that was the computer that ran everything. But really, it was, you know, and it gives away what the plot is because I don't want to right. know that. Well, do you um, know the it, true origin of the of the name Rehoboam? Uh, absolutely not. No. Oh, I was hoping you would because it, it is um, something you would learn about if you went to CCD, for example, or some sort of Bible study. So I wouldn't know about it. Uh, my parents are Israeli. Don't tell my CCD teachers. <laughs> yeah. Rehoboam is the son of Solomon and the grandson of David. This is pretty much all I know. So I can't really tell you all. <laughs> all I know is Solomon. He was the one that did the whole, you know, two mothers arguing over the, the baby, which whose baby it is. And he says, all right, I'll split it in two. And then the real mother is the one who's okay with it because a real mother would be willing to give up her child if it meant saving the child's life wait but how, who is who is rehoboam in that story he so solomon the son? one who said uh, right. i'm gonna cut the baby in half right solomon's son interesting so maybe there was a previous database that kept cutting babies in half and rehoboam <laughs> uh yeah i mean i don't know that so there is like a fidelity thing there right so Charlotte and real Charlotte and and uh, or, or real William and fake William are going to have to um, face off and who's going to kill the code and the one that says kill the oh, code okay. is the real I don't know maybe I don't know we'll chew We're on gonna... it we'll chew on it we'll have a, a better developed theory for for our next episode uh, but with that I think we can wrap it up Jeremy how did you feel about that that was your first you've been on one take before uh, OG one takers heard you on the Mandalorian episodes but this is your first time on a live stream. I think you did a great job. Did it you enjoy fun. it? I had a good time. I appreciate the invite. I am always down for uh, insane theory crafting that's either going to look great or absolutely make no sense in a week. Um, and, I, and I love it. That's the best part about the show. Happy to be here. Always happy to talk theories with you, Gil. Um, and I appreciate the invite. Awesome. Well, we'll hopefully have you back on for the next episode of Westworld. And with that, thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, of course, you got to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell icon to make sure you get notified the next time we do a video and the next time we go live so you can join the stream, be a part of the conversation, throw your own theories into the mix, and that'll be a lot of fun. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next One Take.